Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. My name is Catherine Berry. As uh, you were just told, I'm a bishop of Ecclesia Nostica Catholica. I'm also the internet secretary for United States Grand Lodge, Ordo Templi Orientis, and I could just go on listing my various hats and that would make the presentation time out all by itself. Suffice it to say, I've been in our order a long time. Um, and I've had a lot of jobs and I am still here, which uh, amazes me some days. What you're going to hear tonight from me is a very personal presentation about Phyllis Seckler, who was crucially important in my own development as a magician and as a human being. She has a special place in my own pantheon. I am not going to attempt to do a full exposition of her career, every aspect of her history. I'm not going to bombard you with a lot of places, names, and dates. I am going to attempt to convey to you what she taught me, what I found valuable in the legacy that she left to me and to so many others on this path. It, it's, it is a talk from my heart. Um, it's actually a rather difficult one for me to do for that reason. I'm extremely good at throwing facts and ideas and speculation around. This is coming from a, a deeper and, and warmer part of myself. So I hope I can convey at least a little to those listening how it felt to be Phyllis's student and what that has meant to me. So let us begin. I became a Thelemite under the night stars of the desert in 1986. Now granted, the night stars were above a roof that I was underneath, but nonetheless, they were there. And the particular chunk of desert involved was the scenic Southern California city of Victorville, uh, northeast of Los Angeles in the Mojave Desert a city best known for its truck stops and meth labs. Um, so perhaps not the usual image one has from that passage, but nonetheless, I fulfilled the requirements. My partner and I were visiting friends up there and they had gone off on some errand to get more food or the like. And she was very into Tarot at the time and had got a hold of a copy of Crowley's Book of Thoth. So she pulled that out and continued reading where she'd left off, which happened to be in the chapter covering the card, the star. And all of a sudden, I don't even remember what I was doing, but all of a sudden she says, oh my, listen to this. Because at the end of that chapter of the Book of Thoth is quoted the verse from the Book of the Law, which is, we know as the priestess speech from the mass. But to love me is better than all things. If under the night stars of the desert thou presently burnest mine incense before me, invoking me with a pure heart and the serpent flame therein, thou shalt come a little to lie in my bosom. And it goes on. And I felt like time had stopped. I just listened to that. It's like, my God, what is that? And she says, it says it's from something called the Book of the Law. Well, where do we get one? And so was born the quest. We found a copy of the Book of the Law a few days later at the alas now long gone Bodhi Tree Bookstore in Los Angeles where I live. And we read it and were completely puzzled and read it again and we're still completely puzzled, but there was still something very compelling about it. So we figured, okay, maybe there might be some sort of Crowley related organization still going on. Well, nowadays, of course, Thanks to such tools as the extraordinarily well-organized and copiously indexed United States Grand Lodge website, in my entirely unbiased opinion. Back in those days, it was very hard to find our order. 
and even harder to find out information about where it was, what it was doing, or how to join. And so began a game of writing letters, paper letters that were never answered and making contact with people who responded in unhelpful ways. Long story short, we finally made contact with the LA branch of Ordo Templi Orientis, Baphomet Lodge, and were told that because by this time it was coming up on the winter holiday season, that there were no events occurring for the remainder of the year. So alas, there'd be no way for us to drop by and meet anyone. But there was a date on which it would be possible to schedule our Minerval initiations, the introductory initiation into Ordo Templi Orientis, if we were willing to do it sight unseen. And since I was 25 and indestructible at the time, I went, sure, absolutely. You know, strange cult people, do whatever it is you want to do to me. I'll be there. And so my partner and I showed up on January 2nd, 1987, at Chris Parker's house, um, and far, far away from where we lived. LA is a big place, but we got there into an organized mayhem of people preparing for these initiations and making dinner and running around and doing several different kinds of drugs, it being 1987 OTO. And we felt immediately welcomed. We felt like we had found home. It was so different from what we imagined it might be and so much better. So our initiations ensued, uh, which were just mind alteringly wonderful. And afterward, as I was in that happy deer in the headlights afterglow that accompanies an experience like that and people were wandering around the house, talking, drinking beer, I went into the kitchen to get a beer and over by the sink was this little white haired woman who was rinsing out a glass in the sink. And I hadn't noticed her previously. There were quite a number of people there that evening. And so I sort of tentatively thought, well, maybe it's like, I don't know, Chris's mom or something. I don't know what's going on here. So I say, hi, give, give my name, you know, I, 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 it's nice to meet you. Are, are you. are you a member of OTO? And she says, oh, yes. Oh, OK, cool. Um, um, how long have you been a member? Of course, for me, the answer is 20 minutes. Uh, and she replies, oh, for 45 years. And then the penny dropped, because as I mentioned, we had been searching. We had been looking for information on the order. And among the things we'd found was a copy of Equinox 310, which provided a lot of information about the history of the order including references to Phyllis Seckler. And I suddenly realized I was standing in the same room with her. And my jaw drops and I blurt out, oh my God, you're Phyllis Seckler. Just laughs and yes, yes I am. And that was how I met Phyllis in the, in the warm glow aftermath of one of the most transformative events of my lifetime recognizing this new celebrity in my life from a book that I had read cover to cover about 15 times while awaiting my initiation. And there she is, and we had a lovely conversation. And I was just so impressed by her. She was so warm, so welcoming, so encouraging. Well, it turns out that apparently I made a little bit of an impression on her as well, thanks to the work of our sister Marlene who has been working quite assiduously to organize the, the sort of literary estate of Phyllis Seckler, including her diaries. She came across this from Phyllis's diary on January 2nd, 1987, right there on the third line. She's like, oh, there's a couple of Minerval candidates tonight. What were their names? And here I will begin one of the lessons of this talk, which was while Phyllis was remarkable, a truly stupendous magician, an amazing teacher, clairvoyant in many ways, she did have her failings. And one of them is, is that she was unable to successfully predict that my name would change to Catherine 20 years later. But there it is, Craig and Lori. Um, I, I was so delighted when Marlene ran across this because it's neat to know that, that you know, at least she, she noticed us enough to record us in her diary. And that began my career as at first an admirer and then a student 
of Phyllis Seckler. So as I said, a lot of this talk is going to be about what she taught me. You know, I was her student. What, what did she teach me? What value did I get out of that relationship? But before we go there, just for the benefit of anybody who doesn't know the broad outlines of who she was and what she did, let's cover that. Phyllis was born in 1917 in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. She died in 2004, 87 years old, in Oroville, California, up in the Sierra foothills at her house there. Her OTO career began in 1939 at the old Agape Lodge, which was at the time basically the only functional Ordo Templi Orientis body in the world. Crowley had very bad luck getting OTO to take root um, there were several failed attempts in various places, Vancouver and Detroit and so forth. Los Angeles is the one place where it really seemed to take off, where ag actual initiations and masses were occurring, new members were coming in. And one of those new members was Phyllis, who arrived on the scene in 1939, um, took the magical name or motto, Sor Merrill, M-E-R-A-L. Um, and was a member until 1944, which is when the lodge basically began to dissipate. The, the, the organizational oomph went out of it. But during that time, she was an incredibly active participant took, participant, took several initiations, participated in classes, corresponded with Crowley and other luminaries of the time who were not in Los Angeles. Um, there was a lot of soap opera type drama among the members of Agape Lodge, and she was right in the thick of that. Um, you can read a lot about her exploits here in the book, The Unknown God, which is alas out of print, but I believe the BSO library has a copy of it for when that's a thing again. Um, or you can still score them on eBay at outrageous prices, but um, that, that's the book I'd recommend for a a history of the, the Agape Lodge uh, story. Um, and she has, plays a huge part in that story. She was central to that. But then, as I said, in the late 40s, the Agape Lodge basically fell apart. Crowley died in 1947 um, with Carl Germer taking over as outer head of the order. But the OTO, uh, with Agape going away and no other real or organized bodies left on the planet, more or less disappeared at this time. It was, it was still there on paper as an organization. Germer had a lot of Crowley's books and notes and things like that. And there were these few sort of surviving members, including Phyllis and the Germers and a few others that were still thinking of themselves as being OTO, but there were no new initiations being done, effectively no new bodies being chartered. Everything kind of went into stasis during that period. And here is a picture that kind of summarizes the, the, how, how small and close knit this group is. I, I, by some estimates, what you're looking at is something on the order of 25% of the total OTO membership in the world in 1955. Um, we have Sasha and Carl Germer. Um, Carl Germer, again, being the, the head of the order during this period. Phyllis, um, the, the second from the right. Um, and then Phyllis's teacher, Jane Wolfe, standing next to her. Jane had actually studied with Crowley at uh, the Abbey of Thalema in Sheffaloo and then took on Phyllis as a student when they both lived in Hollywood. Um, and it was from Jane that Phyllis learned a lot of the sort of technical mysteries of the Hermetic arts and of, you know, the, the Thalemic system of magic. So these people, the ones you're looking at right here, bear an outsized responsibility for the fact that you're listening to this class right now, that Thalema isn't a historical footnote remembered by a few very niche scholars, that, that OTO exists as anything but a memory and used books, bookstores. These people are the ones who carried that fire forward through those dark times of the 50s when Nothing was happening. No growth was occurring. No, none of our, our central rituals, our initiations and our mass 
as, as Neil mentioned, none of that was being done. In due time, a man named Grady McMurtry, who had a special warrant from Crowley against exactly this sort of possibility that Germer had died by then, there was no successor that was obvious, um, and he had sort of emergency powers that if the OTO fell on dark times and there was, there was no other option available, that he could step in as the head of the order and get things restarted again. It was sort of a, an emergency safety valve to be, to be used only in the case that all other options had failed. Well, they had. Um, and in 1969, Grady called together all of the remaining OTO folks that he was in touch with and basically said, hey, I've got this charter from Crowley, this, this warrant that, that says I can be the caliph, the new head of the order. I'm doing that now. Anybody want to help? And Phyllis was crucially important to that help. Um, she was actually a Grady's partner for a time. There's a picture of the two of them together. That's Grady. <laughs> he was a remarkable character. And one of my great regrets is that by showing up in 1987, I missed actually meeting him by just a couple of years, less than two years, um, because that, that puts me in the sort of second generation of, of ancient OTO members today. The, the, the real old school ones actually hung out with Grady and can tell stories about him that will curl your hair. Um, I only got them secondhand. But Grady and Phyllis and the others during the period from roughly 1969 to 79 reestablished the OTO as an actual initiating organization, as not an abstraction, not a theory, not a pile of books, but as a real organization doing real work with real people. And the membership began to trickle in. People were initiating, local bodies were being established. One of those that was established was Phyllis's local body, 418 Lodge, um, which was in 1979 and continues unabated to this day, although it's moved to Sacramento in the meantime. Um, there, they began the work of rebuilding our order, putting it back onto something like an operational foundation. By the time I came along, the OTO had sort of begun to fulfill the design that Crowley had expressed for it. Most of the major offices were filled, the initiations were being done, although not well. Um, the mass was being celebrated, though interestingly. Um, a measure of the strangeness of this period um, is that my local body master at the time was also the president of the OTO Electoral College and the deputy grandmaster general, while my bishop was an initiate of the Minerva degree. So it was a very different OTO, um, a very, very primitive, everybody, anyone who walked in who was halfway competent would immediately be handed a job. Um, and then it was sink or swim from there. At the same time, Phyllis was a teacher by profession and by avocation. She was, she was a natural teacher. And she founded an organization called College of Thelema in that same period, which was meant as a tool for students to use to learn the mysteries that lead to personal development, to learn the techniques of things like yoga and evocation and invocation and astral work and also how to reflect within oneself, how to understand yourself better. Over the gates of the mysteries at Eleusis was written, know thyself, and it remains the central commandment of anyone doing this sort of work. She wanted to teach people how to do that. Um, this is the period in which she began publishing her well-known journal in the continuum. Uh, I have a, a full run of these sitting in the back of a closet, which is one of my most cherished possessions, in which she published unavailable Crowley material, her own essays, essays by her students, 
book reviews just did, it was, it acted a lot like the Equinox did in Crowley's day in that it was just sort of an ongoing compendium of material of interest to people on our path to, to sort of help people along and provide resources. You can see her there over on the right. That's in her home holding up uh, a uh, print of the Tree of Life that I remember all too well because I, I sat and, and learned that under her stern teacher's glare um, the entire time that I was working with her. She, she was not satisfied with half measures. So I, I, I look at that and both smile and, and I get a little shiver. Oh, she's about to ask me what the purple one is, isn't she? Oh, shit. Um, um, um. Yeah, um, she, she, was, uh, she was a good teacher. So a very funny story, by the way, which will show you her human side, the fact that she wasn't, you know, a great adept uh, beyond human imagination. She had her foibles. Um, in one of my most treasured issues of In the Continuum, she wrote a short but, but very enthusiastic essay um, using the system of gematria, which is a branch of hermetics derived from Hebrew mysticism in which you look at the special meanings of the numeric values of words because in languages like Hebrew and Greek every number is also a letter and it happens that um, the Hebrew letters themselves are words you can spell them out in full and then see what that would add up to and she wrote a whole article for her College of Thelema newsletter in the continuum about how wonderfully symbolic and important and crucial and, and you know, instructive it was that the Hebrew letter tet or teth added up to 418, which is a truly significant number in the mysteries. You can probably tell by the fact that she named her lodge after it. And then it fell to her students to kind of draw lots to see which of us was going to say, um, Phyllis, actually, that is up to 419. And she laughed and laughed and laughed and said, well, I was close. So I, I, one of my favorite things about her was her humility. She was like, yeah, well, I screwed that one up. So anyway, 419 is also an interesting number, and she would launch off on that. She was so many different things. She was a, a wife and a mother at various times. She was a teacher, as I mentioned, a writer, uh, a really good writer. Um, her writings have been collected into a couple of books, which I cannot possibly recommend highly enough. And an artist, quite, quite a remarkable artist. Here on the left, you see one of her paintings, titled Nuit which I just find spectacularly beautiful. Um, and on the right there, you see her sitting in front of the altar of her downstairs temple at her home in Oroville. Um, given the, the, the chair up there and the way she's leaning on the small altar there, I imagine this was before or after one of her classes that were held in that same room. So she was, she was remarkably well-rounded. She had skills and knowledge in a number of different areas. And she brought all that to bear as a mentor. She was a mentor to many of the people who were involved in creating U.S. Grand Lodge. At first, I think more than half of the people involved in the upper levels of the newly formed U.S. Grand Lodge in 1996 were people who had been either Phyllis's students or at least profoundly influenced by Phyllis. So she left an enormous imprint on our order through her teaching, through her mentorship, her encouragement, her corrections. She has, has had an outsized effect on the order that you see today. I am reasonably convinced that without her work, without her influence, without her, her support, we wouldn't have made it. That that generation of people that she trained um, and, and me too, um, without, without us, without her help, th this wouldn't have gotten off the ground. So we owe her an enormous debt for the fact we're here, the fact that the OTO is a thing, that we are continuing to succeed, that we are growing, that we are initiating, that we are, we are sharing our teachings with the public. A lot of those teachings were carried to us by Phyllis. There's a line 
in the fifth collect of the Gnostic Mass that transmitted the light of the Gnosis to us, their successors and their heirs. And I often think of Phyllis when that line comes up because I think more than almost any other single person, she fulfilled that role with me and with many others. She, she was remarkable in the influence she had. Okay, so that's Phyllis in a nutshell, who she was, what she did. What did she teach? I've been sitting here going on and on about how profoundly influential she was and how important she has been in my life. What was the magic recipe? What did she tell us? Well, can't talk about Phyllis as a teacher without going here first. Projection. When you became Phyllis's student, the very first exercise you were given was to record your projections for a month. A projection is when you put part of yourself, some element of your psyche, onto someone else. You take something that's really in you and move it psychologically outside you onto another person. They arise from unacknowledged psychological content. As Jung would put it, the shadow. That part of yourself that you have not recognized, incorporated, allowed to exist is all pushed into the shadow, but it's not quiet there. It doesn't, it doesn't take being shoved aside well. And so it tends to erupt in other ways. And one of the main tricks it uses is projection. Those things that you will not acknowledge about yourself, you will see on people around you. And it does not necessarily imply a negative projection. There are plenty of positive projections, taking something unacknowledged that is good in yourself and putting it outside you. So yeah, that was revelatory. You know, she gave us a brief talk on what a projection was and how to recognize one and then set us to diary writing. And in the first four days, I was just like, I, I have like no control over my thoughts whatsoever. What the hell's going on in here? How, how could I have been doing this all this time? And you know, those are the questions you have to ask at the beginning of a path like ours. It's like, oh my God, what, what, how, how can I control the, this riot of uncontrolled pushing of myself outside myself? That, that's got to stop. And the story of that trick has been the last 33 years of my life. I've, I've made some progress, but it's a very difficult one. Um, and I still do the projection exercise. It served me extraordinarily well. So what are some examples of projection? Well, it could be something inside you that is not that you have not acknowledged about yourself. So for example, a, a classic one, if you are thinking about but haven't quite acknowledged you're thinking about being unfaithful to your partner, you are way more likely to accuse your partner of being unfaithful to you. That latent unfaithfulness that you will not acknowledge, your desire, your, your beginning to do that sort of back of the head, well, what if I, that you won't acknowledge because, oh, I'm not that kind of person. I wouldn't do that, but you're thinking about it and you're not acknowledging thinking about it. Well, now every suspicious thing your partner does becomes, oh, Oh, I bet I know what's happening there because you're projecting it onto them. I, I hope everyone listening to this is going, uh-huh, because we all do it. It is unavoidable to do that. You can also project your relationship with someone else. So, for example, if you are having a really disproportionately bad emotional reaction to being criticized by your female boss at work, it may be because your mother was very critical of you in a similar way, and you are projecting your mom issues onto her. That one is insidious. And again, it happens to all of us all the time. We see something of an unresolved issue with someone else, and someone who just vaguely happens to fit that template gets the full brunt of the emotional force that we would like to put on the primary and we can't. So it squirts out sideways. 
You know, it will find a way to manifest itself. And projection is the classic way. It's a, it's a very easy way for your psyche to say, oh, yeah, you're going to ignore this. Nope. No, you're not. So what are the dangers of projection? Well, first off, and this is, you know, where, where a therapist would go with you, is that it creates inappropriate emotional reactions, either because you're accusing your partner of something that they're not actually doing, or you're taking everything that you should value in yourself and say, no, no, it's all because of you. I wouldn't be anything without you. You're taking all of this stuff that is inappropriately emotional and putting it onto someone else. Well, that's going to drown out the signal of actual communication. If you don't know what's you and what's them, how can you have a rational conversation about negotiating boundaries, so resolving relationship issues, negotiating with your boss for a raise? Any of those things are going to be impossible if the signal is drowned out by the noise of un unallocated emotional content that is rushing out to fill this place where it can find expression. So that's, that's enough. I mean, if that were all it did, um, it would be a good reason to try and get these things under control. But there's another one, which is probably even more insidious, which is putting yourself on others makes it a lot harder to know thyself, which I'll remind you is the beginning and the end of the mysteries. It's all about understanding who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. And if you are taking all of the things that are happening in you and blaming or crediting them to other people, you're not going to get an accurate picture of who you are, are you? Because you're missing huge chunks of it. As one of my friends memorably put it, if everyone you've met by lunchtime has been an asshole, maybe they're not the assholes. That's projection. You're having a crappy day, so suddenly everyone in the world is being an asshole? I doubt it. No, you're projecting your inner asshole onto them, and it's poisoning every attempt you have to relate to someone, to have a conversation, to do something as simple as ask for a favor. It's being poisoned by this unacknowledged emotional content that you're trying to find somewhere to offload. So, that brings us to a fascinating topic, transference, and its subcategory, idealization. Transference is basically the application as a technology of projection in which you elicit the tendency of someone to put parts of themselves outside themselves in order to achieve a particular goal. So for example, in a psychological therapeutic relationship, it is expected that the client will transfer some of their emotions onto the therapist because the whole idea is to get them out in the sunlight where they can be seen. It is an example of the magical formula of evocation in which you take something that is unseen and within and put it out in the triangle where you can keep an eye on it and deal with it in bright sunshine where it can't sneak around the back and undermine you. And we use this technology in OTO and in every other religious organization all the time because it is psychologically effective in the mass. Every member of the congregation is invited to allow the officers of the mass to serve as projections of parts of their own soul, as sort of exemplars or avatars of parts of themselves who are working out this sort of ritualized drama of a process of spiritual metabolism, which is actually happening within them at that very moment and will happen in a particularly ritualized form at the moment of Eucharist but it's all being done outside them so that it can be acknowledged, so that it can be seen and done with intention. Similarly, in an initiation, the, the candidate is 
effectively pre being projected onto the officers of the initiation who become the avatars of aspects of their will to achieve enlightenment, self-actualization, whatever word you want to put on it, the great work. They materialize things, aspects of the candidate which might otherwise have remained unseen and latent. And by giving them form, by giving them a place to express, they provide a way for the candidates to acknowledge and incorporate them consciously, intentionally. And as I go through my magical career, with each passing day, I'm more certain that intention and magic are synonyms. So this process of transference can be extraordinarily powerful. And I mean that in both a good and a bad way, because the other thing it can do is take away your agency. If it's used with bad intent or in, in, incautiously, you can end up with you know, the, the guru or devil complex in which you take everything good about yourself and say, oh, no, 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 I am nothing without Jesus or Krishna or my guru or the pastor of my church. I'm, I'm worthless. I'm, I'm hopeless. I'm, 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 I need saving. Or you can say, I'd be fine if it weren't for that one person who's ruined my entire life. And, you know, I've, I, I, it's, there's no fault in me. Everything that's gone wrong is because of them. In either case, you are taking crucial parts of yourself and not taking control of them, not using them intentionally. By projecting them onto something else, someone else, you lose your ability to apply them under will. And that is like the worst possible thing for a magician. You want to have all the parts of your soul on speed dial. You want to have them lined up and ready to serve your will. And if you've put them in something external to you, then they're out of your control and they can be used to control you. And again, that's, that's the long con of most organized religions. Is, is that they, they pull off this trick and then just keep you on the hook. It's like, you know, yes, all the good parts of you are outside you. We have the patent on them. And you can only have parts of them back on an incremental basis by sticking around and following our rules. Very powerful formula if you can get people to buy into it. So this transference process, while again, used properly, used with skill and proper intention and, and with caution, can be a powerful transformative engine. It's like you know radioactive material. You have to be very cautious with it. You have to be very careful how you use it. You have to watch for signs of transference. Our, our brother David Shoemaker, who is a psychologist, did a seminar on the, the psychological impact of OTO initiation, in which he talked about one of the greatest dangers of our initiations is that people will transfer not onto the figures of the initiating officers as officers, but onto the people involved. And that's what leads to, you know, guru complexes and also denunciations and all of these ills that I just talked about. So Phyllis, by alerting us all to this, immunized us against one of the main sources of interpersonal strife, going well off the path, becoming controlled or controlling without intention, all of these things, this one exercise that she drummed into us and followed up to make sure that we are bloody well following it every damn day was itself by itself, if that's all she'd ever done, probably enough to credit her with the, the relative success of the people she taught and the order that she helps sustain. It's, it, is, it, it has been one of the most important tools in my life being aware of this and applying this exercise of just recording them, doing a daily inventory. What projections have I done today? What, what have I taken that was really in me and put it on someone else? And what were the circumstances? How can I watch for that? How can I guard against it happening again? Simple, one weird trick, right? But my God, it's effective. My partner, the one who introduced me to uh, that passage from the Book of the Law, had a beautiful realization about this with regard to the Holy Guardian Angel. 
because for those of you not familiar, the holy guardian angel is the term used in Thelema for the idea of the higher self or the spirit guide or the guardian or any of a number of ideas. The, 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 the part of the eternal that comes to you and helps you along the path. And she realized as she was doing her projection exercise one day, oh my God, I'm projecting everything good in me onto my angel. No, I'm good. Yes, the, the angel is there and helping me and so forth, but it's not that I'm a piece of shit and the angel is here to rescue me. And that was just like, my, my head exploded. It's like, oh, no, of course you're right. Oh my God, I've been doing that too. So it, it can happen to Thelemites, ladies and gentlemen. This is, this is a pernicious danger and being immunized against it is very highly recommended. One of the very, very first projections I recorded for Phyllis was that I was transferring loving thoughts of my mom onto her. <laughs> they were both from the upper Midwest. She was from Alberta. My mom was from Wisconsin. They both had that kind of upper Midwest Swedish cadence to their voice. And she looked not dissimilar and of course was in this caring, nurturing, mentoring role. So I, I sort of, you know, blushing, beet red, told Phyllis, I, 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 I've actually been projecting my mom onto you. And she laughed and said, oh yes, I get that a lot. If we have time after the talk, by the way, I invite all of you to, in, in the back of your mind, be thinking about your projections that have happened today or recently. And if, if, if the conversation goes that way, perhaps we can share some examples. All right, so that's projection. And again, just that would have been enough to make Phyllis's teaching absolutely invaluable to me. But what she taught me next completely melted my brain and changed me in a fundamental way. And that is, and I'm, I am directly quoting here right now, a system that is perfectly balanced just sits there. And that has become a mantra for me in my life. Let me tell you a story about Kabbalah. I believe I'm going to be teaching a class on Kabbalah at BSO sometime soon, so this will make a nice little lead-in for that, but it's a standalone story of when I was learning Kabbalah. Kabbalah is, of course, the, the Hebrew mystical system, esoteric system, that divides the unity of God into a multitude of parts, you know, 10 or 22 or 32 or 4 or multiples of those, so that basically the un incomprehensible unity of God can be broken up into pieces small enough to fit into a human head. That's, that's the sort of elevator pitch for Kabbalah. And it's, I love categorization. I am just a wee bit on the autistic spectrum. Um, if I were giving this talk when I were 20, everyone would have hung up already because I hadn't yet learned how to stop talking about the things that interest me and start talking about the things that interest my audience. That was, that was a nice trick when I figured that one out. But I love categorization. I can endlessly play with how a system should be subdivided. I write software for a living and I will lovingly spend 20 minutes deciding, well, should there be three methods in two classes or one class with four methods? How to subdivide a problem, how to break something up into pieces. My, my mom ruefully tells the tale that when I was three years old, rather than playing with my toys, I would lay them out in the floor and then categorize them by color or size or type or whatever, and then be dissatisfied with that categorization and rearrange them a different way. So yeah, I like nice, clean, crisp, clear, elegant categorizations. So initially, Kabbalah was just like Candyland. It was playground time. It's like, wow, a whole system that's made out of breaking things into little pieces by, by different numbers and then correlating them back to each other. This is going to be great. And then I actually started studying Kabbalah and became furious. I was so, so ticked off. Here's a picture of the tree of life. It's basically, as I said, a sort of model of the, the, the structure of the universe or of the parts of the universe. 
going from the, the unity of Kether up at the top down to the 10th sphere, Malkuth at the bottom, which is sort of the material world where, where you live. I've always wanted a t-shirt with this on it with a pointer to the bottom saying you are here. But that's the tree. And initially it looks gorgeously, gorgeously symmetric. Everything's balanced, everything's nice equilateral triangles. There's every, you know, it, it's symmetric left to right. And then the trouble starts because as I began studying it, I found out among other things, among many other things, this. The paths of fire, the red upward triangle and water, the blue downward triangle are there on the tree. What in the name of God, literally, is going on here? Fire and water are clearly opposites. Every magical system has them as being opposed to one another. Why aren't they symmetrically across from one another? Why aren't they, say, both on the middle pillar, one at the top, one at the bottom? Or why isn't fire over there on the right, you know, on the other side of the yellow sphere in the middle? Anything but this, where they're both on the same side and on different kinds of paths and all bunched up toward the bottom. It's like, what? What's going on here? This is wrong. I, I wanted to just like jump in and start rearranging it. And there are actually authors who have done exactly that. Either there's a book I treasured when I was in this period where someone had systematically rearranged the tree of life so that it made sense. And I, I argued for it passionately. Uh, ah, the folly of youth, right? So it gets worse, believe it or not. If you look what is opposite these paths, we find opposite the path of water, the upper one, is the path of Jupiter, the thing that looks like a stylized four there. And opposite the path of fire is the path assigned to the astrological sign Pisces. So we have two elements on one side and a planet and an astrological sign on the other. I mean, what, did they just like throw this shit at the wall? What, what possible sense could this make? This is, I was, I was literally angry. I was, I was, because the thing had such promise of being such a beautiful, symmetrical, balanced glyph of the structure of the universe. And it's like, this is, the universe is not this messy. It isn't this incoherent. Oh, little did I know at the time, right? So Phyllis sat me down and she said, no, no, it is not perfectly symmetrical. A system that is perfectly balanced just sits there. A system has to be out of balance. There has to be a place for motion to happen before anything else can occur. All life, all the, every part of creation is built on imbalance. So of course the tree of life is imbalanced, but there are deeper symmetries to be found. And then she did this to me. Let's take a look at those two bottom paths in terms of what card of the tarot they are attributed to. We find on the left for fire, the eon, and on the left for Pisces, the moon. So on we, what we have balanced against one another here are that revelatory moment of blinding light in which the veil between you and God is dropped and a new reality suddenly comes shining through. Note that revelation is simply the English translation of apocalypse, and both of them simply mean to reveal from hiding. And the old name of this card was indeed the last judgment. So that image, when to suddenly... God is right there. God, the, the blinding light fills everything. All changes in an instant. That's what the Eon card is about. The moon is about the dark, wet work. The slow, patient rhythms that underlie life. The ebb and flow of the tides, of the menstrual cycle, the rotations of the earth and the moon and the planets the cycle of day and night, the cycle of human lives, all those slow cycles that just repeat themselves over and over and over again. Do you see how beautifully complementary they are? We have the absolutely novel, unrepeatable, one-time brilliance against the dark, dank cycles of never-ending organic life. 
they couldn't be more complementary. But it's not on the surface. You have to go one level down to begin seeing why those two are opposite one another. And then there are levels beyond that. And then there are levels beyond that. And I've been exploring those levels for 33 years, and there's no bottom so far as I can tell. The system works because it is imbalanced. It has to be for life to happen, for there to be any emotion at all. Let's do the same trick with the upper pair. On the left, we had water in the tarot. That brings us to a hanged man. A figure suspended, motionless, in, in a pool by an inverted onk, the symbol of eternal life. Body contorted into a position which might possibly have some sort of symbolic connotations, which I'll leave aside for now. But a figure of frustrated motion, of the inability to move forward. Mame is the path you're on when you've tried everything you can to change a situation, you're exhausted, you're defeated, and the situation just keeps going. And you know it's got to end, but it just doesn't seem to want to. Who, who all has felt that emotion recently? That's the path of Mame. Opposite it, we have the path of Kof, which is fortune, or the wheel of fortune in some decks which is a motion in endless, endless rotation, a wheel in endless rotation, cycling around and around. Sometimes one figure's on top, sometimes the other figure's on the top. Endless motion. There, 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 there's no ability to stop the motion. You go up and then right away you go right back down again, and then you're on top again, and then you go down again. The only way to find peace here is in the center. Notice how well the center of this wheel corresponds to the center of the figure on the left. The frustration of being unable to move and the frustration of being unable to stop moving are complementary. They're aspects of the same frustration. That's a lesson that I would not have found if I hadn't looked deeper than my initial disgust with the fact, but they're not pretty. They're not perfectly symmetrical the way I want them to be, no. They're perfectly symmetrical in a way that teaches you things, that makes you think about, well, yes, you can be doing a lot. You can be running around at full speed and just accomplishing nothing. And you can be in absolute stasis and find a way to make it meaningful. Those are both paths that are possible. And it's up to you to navigate them in a way that furthers your will. But finding, discovering that these two, these two states are just sides of the same coin, literally just the left and the right aspects of the same part of the tree, opened my mind. Finding that hidden under the seeming senseless asymmetry taught me something. And there's nothing more valuable than that kind of discovery. So we have a corollary, which is a system that is entirely pinned down can't move. You have to embrace the ambiguity of things. And that has been the hardest thing for me because again, I'm an engineer, I am a bit autistic, I want predictability, I want routine, I want to know what's going to happen next. And I have learned to cultivate a, an appreciation, a love, an aesthetic appeal in ambiguity and transience and unpredictability. I, those of you who looked at my bio might notice that I'm a student of the Aztec sacred mysteries and their embrace of transience is the highest beauty contributed to this as well. But it was Phyllis who broke down my barriers and forced my head down to look at it. And for that, I will always bless her. Because without somebody forcing me, I was never going to get over that barrier myself. So embracing the ambiguity in things finds practical application for those of us who are initiates of Ordo Templi Orientis in the almost... Um, absurdly convoluted system of the governance of our order. 
which at first, again, I thought was a bug and have come to consider a feature. There's a whole talk we do at Kaba Colloquium, our leadership training seminar that we hold twice a year in various parts of the country when the plague isn't on the land, called the Elephant in the Temple, where we talk about OTO power dynamics and the fact that thanks to the interesting design of our system, it is very rare for a single individual to hold total authority over all aspects of anything we try to do. And again, that, that can seem like an, an unnecessary complication. Instead, it's a challenge to embrace that and work within it, to find ways to make that valuable. And it does force us to talk to one another and reach uh, accord with one another and various other lessons of fraternity, which one might imagine are applicable to a fraternal order such as ours. Another quote I like in this regard, by the way, is one um, from uh, J.B.S. Haldane, um, a, a well-known biologist and philosopher, um, great combination, British guy. There's this special word biologists have for stable. It is dead. That's another one that I carry with me as, as a treasured mantra to remind myself, no, stable isn't what you're after. For a magician, motion is necessary. Magic is ruled by mercury. Mercury does not stay still, almost by definition. So the ongoing exercises, like, like I still do the projection exercise, the exercises that arise from this are embracing and delighting in asymmetry and ambiguity wherever I find it, which is not reflexive for me, even after all these years, but I make myself, I make myself see why, oh wait, in this change, there is both intrinsic beauty and opportunity. There, there may be things that we can do now that the ground has shifted underfoot that weren't possible before. Even though I didn't anticipate this coming and a large part of my psyche is rebelling against it, this might be opening a door that was jammed before. And this, this is a refrain that I have been repeating ad nauseum to OTO folks I talk to with regard to our current quarantine situation. Look at the fact that with a gun to our heads, with no opportunity to do any of our usual activities, there's been a great flowering of OTO online education throughout the country. I mean, BSO is by no means the only body that is doing this. My own home body down here in Los Angeles, Star Sapphire, is doing better financially right now than we were before the pandemic hit because we have found there's this enormous untapped demand for online classes. We would not have done that experiment. We wouldn't have had to fully commit to it and fight to make it work unless we'd had no other choice. And that was another powerful lesson for me. Sometimes movement is both painful and necessary. And the other lesson that I get from this is to watch yourself for, especially when talking about, you know, mysteries, the, the, the topics of hermetic magic, et cetera, be very wary of A is B statements. So for example, the wand is fire. They are always either wrong, incomplete, or tautological. If the wand is fire, then why do we have two different words? There must be differences between them, one would imagine. Yes, the wand is attributed to fire, and the magical weapon of fire is the wand, but that doesn't mean that the wand is fire. Did you see the shadings of meaning there are very important. Um, there is a wonderful book called um, Science and Sanity by an author named Alfred Krzyzewski, who wrote it in the 30s, um, trying to found a field called general semantics that is still kind of limping along today. But I, I read that book when, when I was doing this exercise and it exploded my brain again, um, in which he invites you to drop all use of the linking verb to be to describe attributes of things just as, as a mental exercise, as, as, as a sort of practice of dharana. So rather than saying that car is green, that car has the color green. He is tall, he has a lot of height. The difference, you're not reducing, you're not doing A is B. And it is the most difficult exercise and revelatory because you realize 
this is the root from which spring bias and prejudice, you know, jumping to conclusions, et cetera, because we, we overgeneralize from an attribute to the whole. So I cannot possibly recommend that enough. And if, if you have the stamina for it, um, reading Science and Sanity was, was great for me, but I am extremely peculiar. Others have told me they couldn't get through five pages of it. So the challenge is open. Let me know what happens to you. All right, then. On to the third and in many ways most important of the lessons that I am going to share with you tonight. And once again, this is going to be a direct quote and it is one that I hear in my head, in Phyllis's voice, when, when I need to be reminded, tend your own garden. She said that to me probably four or five times because I am stubborn and thick-headed. She was a gardener, a brilliant gardener. You can see her there in her garden in Oroville. She had a plot of land on a typical scrub oak hillside outside Oroville, which again is in the Sierra foothills, kind of west of Sacramento, or east of Sacramento, pardon me. Um, and her neighbor's plots were what you expect from that kind of country, you know, yellow grass and occasional little scrubby oaks and, you know, some manzanita here and there, but just mostly open space and, and wild grass. And then he got to her plot, which went up behind her house up this, this you know, shallow hill, probably the, the back end of the lot was maybe 60 feet higher than the front. And it was the Garden of Eden. She had probably a dozen different kinds of trees growing in there. Lord knows how many kinds of flowers and bushes. There was a little artificial stream that ran down through it. There were little places where you could sit off to the side and meditate. It was, it was paradise. It was one of the most, and again, the other side of the little wire fence was her neighbor's plot, which was dry grass and scrub oaks. And at one point I was, I was over by the fence and the neighbor came by and he said, oh, you're visiting Phyllis, huh? And I said, yeah, isn't this garden amazing? And he says, yeah, I guess she just has a magic touch. I guess she does. So what did she mean by tend your own garden? And under what circumstances do I hear her voice in my head and see her shaking her head sadly like, oh, Lordy, I have to tell him this again. All right, tend your own garden. Step one, mind your own business. For those of you who are any flavor of geek, um, you will either A, recognize this as being one of the best XKCD cartoons ever published, or B, Lord, where have you been? Um, go immediately and read all 1,500 back XKCDs because it is the geekiest cartoon ever made. It is not your responsibility to correct everyone on the internet. It's not possible, but even more so, it is not your responsibility. Understanding what your responsibilities are is key to sanity and productivity. Each of us has our own work to do. It's a, it's a central part of the Thalamic doctrine that each of us has a true will, some, some purpose, some reason that we incarnated here. And that our task is to find it and do that. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. It's right there on the label. And it is so easy to get distracted. You know, I don't think he's doing as well. Right. Oh, well, no, I don't think that's the right way to do that. Oh, no, you're wrong about this point. of All of that is distractions. You have to be able to figure out with, with certainty and conviction and carry it through into action when to back off and shut up. And that is the hardest thing in the world to do when someone is being actively and, and egregiously wrong on the internet. But I've learned the hard way that it is no good to try and correct things on the internet, alas. And there are many other fields in which it is not appropriate to jump in and try and sort things out. You have your own work to do. Tend your own garden. Now, sometimes it is really your responsibility. One of, one of my favorite stories, I mentioned that I'm the, the internet secretary for US Grand Lodge, but I'm also a bunch of other things, uh, you know, a bishop and a sovereign grand inspector general and this, that, and the other. 
So one day, out of the blue, I get a phone call from one of the members of the U.S. Grand Lodge executive, the, the you know the triad at the top of it all, who calls me up and says, "Um, we have, we have a little issue. There's there's a local body that uh, has just like um, published a a redesign of their website for their members to look at. It's not live yet." Um, and it's, it's a little bit problematic. We, we think there's some issues there with what they're saying and how that connects to, you know, U.S. Grand Lodge policy and so forth. Um, could you please, like, like today, take a look at that and get in touch with them and let them know if they're, they're out, out of policy and blah, blah, blah. And my first reaction is, oh, Jesus Christ, why me? I'm busy. I, oh, God damn it. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm Internet Secretary, aren't I? Okay, yes, I'll do that. Because that one was my responsibility. As, as one of my, my bosses once memorably put it, if you walk around wearing a silver star, eventually someone is going to expect you to shoot at bad guys. That is your responsibility. But you have to know when that is. If I had just been some ordinary member and had gotten that phone call, I could have, with a completely clear conscience, said, no, I'm busy with my own work. I can't do that right now. That is, that is an absolutely fine thing to do. And you have to learn to do that, especially if you are attempting to get any of your own work done. You have to learn how to say no, both to yourself and to other people, when it's not your business, when it is not your responsibility. And at the top of this list is it is not your business to tell someone else that they are doing the great work wrong. There is, is infinite support for this in our Thalamic literature. I will um, quote just from Liber Libre. Blaspheme not the name by which another knoweth his God. The central principle of will is that it is unknowable to anyone but you. Whatever anyone around you is doing, however self-destructive, however counterproductive, Unless it is directly interfering with your will, it is not your responsibility to tell them they're wrong. You might, as a matter of courtesy, fraternal, you know, support, etc., say, um, excuse me, from over here, it looks like you're running directly toward a cliff. And if they yell back, yep, I'm going cliff jumping, then you wave and smile and wish them luck. That's theirs to do. And if there's a lesson in it, that's their lesson. Don't, don't steal people's lessons from them. This does not mean you can't offer aid. This does not mean you cannot provide advice. This does not mean that you can't intervene if you think someone is temporarily irrational or you know, behaving impulsively or the like. Those are all special cases. But if someone has shown a documented months long desire to jump over that cliff and states it clear headed, sober, Yes, I'm going to jump over that cliff now. That's not your problem. It is not your job to argue with them, stop them, do anything other than say, may your will be done. Best of luck. The next great facet of this lesson. Do your own work. The first word of our law is do, not argue, not post, not complain, do. I said earlier, magic is defined by motion, by action. There, my other great early magical teacher, Jim Eshelman, provided a memorable quote here. Most so-called magicians are like guys sitting on the beach reading swimwear catalogs. There's a strong tendency to fall back into theory, into abstraction, into argument uh, about, you know, what some obscure passage of some book meant, rather than doing our central work, which reduces to find your will, and then do that. So never lose sight of the fact that what you are meant to be doing is your work. Make sure that you are, at any given time, doing something that will further your work. 
And there's an exercise, this is, this is actually one of mine, this is not from Phyllis, but it derives from her principle. I have trained people that I work with for, for a couple of decades now to do um, what I call the to what end exercise. Those of you who've been around Thelemites have probably seen the way that we say will over meals, the way that a Christian would say grace, you know, do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. What is thy will? It is my will to eat and drink. To what end? That my body may be fortified thereby. To what end? That I may accomplish the great work. And that therefore ties eating that meal is an expression of the great work. And that's an aspect of doing your will. If you don't nourish yourself, you're not going to get a lot of other work done, right? So that is sacred. That is, that is holy. That is an aspect of the will, making sure that you're physically healthy, getting enough sleep, getting enough to eat, you know, taking care of your body are all aspects of will. So the, the, the lesson here is do that same trick with someone with all the other parts of your life. Train yourself to interrupt yourself at random intervals or set an alarm or whatever and ask in that moment, what am I doing? I am playing Civilization VI. To what end? So that I might relax and detox and have some private time playing around in something that doesn't matter so I can unwind and get some sleep tonight. To what end? That I can wake up tomorrow refreshed and feeling like I've had enough time to myself so that I can enthusiastically continue doing my job. To what end? That I may accomplish the great work. And at that point, I've drawn a dotted line. I can explain with brutal honesty to myself, it's crucial that you do not fool yourself about this. You have to be brutally honest because the other way that dialogue could go is, what are you doing? I'm playing Civ 6. To what end? That I can um, be like all relaxed and stuff tomorrow. But it's 2 a.m. and I have to be up at 7. And that's not going to happen, is it? Ah, oh, crap. I'm off the beam. That's what you're looking for. Do your own work and nothing but your own work. And again, your own work can be sitting watching YouTube for an hour, but it's probably not sitting watching YouTube for eight hours. It can be having a brownie. It's probably not eating an entire tray of brownies. It's all about context. It's all about the, the, the just application of the tools at your disposal. The same action can be furthering or countering your will, depending on how much of it you're doing, how often you do it, what the context is in which you're doing it. There are no moral absolutes here. There's only the rule, do your own work. And the corollary, which is you had best refine your understanding of what your work is and how to recognize when you're doing it. If others happen to benefit from your work, then all the better, but that's a side effect. I am doing my work right now, as I understand it. I, as you know, teaching this kind of class, spreading the ideas that have helped me perfect myself to the degree I have, is as, as clearly as I can imagine ever demonstrating to myself, central to my work. So right now, doing that true will exercise would be really easy for me. But you have to figure out how to do that in your life. What, what things you're doing for others are in line with your will and which ones are detrimental to your will and act accordingly. And all of this implies and this is going to sound odd for those of you who are or hang out with Thelemites, but to me, this implies a certain kind of humility. You are doing your work for you, not, not for recognition, not for approval. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do, because it is your formula. And it doesn't matter if anyone notices or cares. If it is your work and you're doing it, then you are on the path. I think Phyllis's reputation in some quarters has actually suffered because she considered it to be gauche to flaunt her status. And she was self-effacing about her own progress on the path. She was surrounded by people who were very loud and very prone to trumpeting and self-promoting. 
And in contrast, she was relatively quiet and honest about where she was and what she was doing and what she was capable of. There's a wonderful letter she wrote to Carl Germer um, in which she talks about the astral exercises she's been given to do and says that she's been having great difficulty with them. I don't know how many people listening to this have ever attempted serious astral work, but it is incredibly difficult. Everyone has difficulty with it. This is hard work. This is difficult stuff. This is not the kind of thing that everyone's going to find success in immediately, or even after decades of work. There are aspects of it that are always going to be challenging. Phyllis was honest about that, about her own work, about where she stood in it. Similarly, she taught us all how to do the thalamic salutation of the sun, the Liber Resh, as it's called. It's four times a day at the quarters of the sun. We face the sun, uh, recite some material, and there's a direction to give the, quote, signs of your grade. And when Phyllis was teaching us, she was using the a neophyte sign as she did it with us. And I asked her one time, because I knew she had to be more than that. I mean, heck, she's been doing this since the 40s. She had to be more than the, the lowest grade of the AA. And she said, darling, it isn't proper to flaunt one's degree. Oh. And that culture, by the way, is one of the greatest treasures of the OTO that it is gauche to flaunt your degree. I've seen organizations where people walk around with it literally or figuratively on their shoulders and everything is all the seating and the, the dinner arrangements and everything are all organized by degree. And in OTO, walking up to someone saying, what degree are you, is gonna get you the big old stink eye. That's just not done. And having something be gauche, not done, is a thousand times more effective at preventing it than having a rule. And I think Phyllis has a large credit in having instilled that culture in us that it's just not done. It's, it's not proper. It would be, it would be tawdry to, to go there. That's, that's not anyone, that's not your business to ask someone else what their degree is. And so we have this lovely culture where if it matters, then I will tell someone that I am whatever degree is necessary to the task. So if somebody asks me a question about, say, you know, initiating in the, the you know, Minerva through third degrees, I will answer as a third degree and say I am a third degree because that's all that's necessary for that purpose. And that, that culture, that, that expectation that everybody's progress through the ranks of our order, everyone's own work is theirs to share or not as they will, but flaunting it and even more so asking it is a cultural no-no, I think has guarded us, has insulated us against a lot of the, the rot that can afflict organizations where that isn't the culture. And then finally, find your own path. That's another shot of Phyllis in the garden, a wider one. I wish I could go there again. It was just the best place. Um, sorry, I'm getting a little teary-eyed. That happened last time I did this talk too. Find your own path. Phyllis was extremely well-versed in hermetics in the mysteries of Thalema, in Crowley's writings. You know, she published the, the only quasi-academic journal on the topic in the continuum for, a, you know, quite a long time. She taught people who've gone on to be quite successful working this branch of, of hermetic science. So, you know, I think the, the you know, the proof is in the pudding. She, she knew all of the stuff that is taught by people like Crowley in his writings and that is taught in the systems that she was involved with, she knew it forward, backward, and sideways and could teach it. But the way that she achieved 
whatever you care to call it, gnosis, the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, enlightenment, self-actualization, you know, we can argue labels all day and all night, but the way she got it, the way, the way she perfected herself was through gardening. Gardening as an act of bhakti devotion. She would work in that garden all day long sometimes and meditate as she gardened and devote the work to her angel. And through that, she became one of a handful of individuals that I fully believe got there, achieved the wedding, united with their higher self, however, again, you want to put it. And I find it enormously illuminating that while she knew and could apply all of the technologies that someone like Crowley teaches as the mechanisms to carry out that work, she herself did it through bhakti yoga expressed in gardening. And there is a ludicrously important lesson there, which is find your own path. There are infinitely many ways to do the great work. Don't be constrained by any particular scoring system. The only one ultimately with the power to score your own efforts is you. The Book of the Law is one of the shortest holy books um, in, in the, 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 among the major ones. I think the Tao Te King is a little shorter and that might be the only one that has a speed. 220 verses, most of them not particularly long. Not a lot of room for repetition in a book that length. And yet it has within it two nearly identical statements, variations on success is your proof. If hermetic magic is making you more effective, more self-actualized, to having more awareness of your innate divinity, making you more capable of carrying out your work in the world, then by all means, follow that path. It's a, it's a beautiful and extremely effective one for some people. If gardening is doing that for you, then by all means, stick with gardening. Whatever path you have, test it by the metric that the Book of the Law gives us, success. Not by whether it's what someone told you to do, not by whether you, what you think is the right system when you started, but measure it by success. What the main thing that attracted me to Thalema when I found it is that it is an empirical religion. It does not invite you or demand of you that you accept a doctrine, that you adhere to dogma. There, there is no such thing as a heresy in Thelema. Heresy is from a Greek root meaning to choose, and to choose is the essence of Thelema, which of course has caused me to spend 30 years trying to figure out a way to be a Thelemic heretic, because I like a good challenge. But you, in the end, get to choose, and only you get to decide whether you've succeeded. And people forget that because there's a desire to conform or to find someone to please or to take off the responsibility of evaluating whether you are happy and you are making progress and you are fulfilling yourself. Finding someone who will tell you that you are happy and fulfilled in making progress is much simpler and easier in the short run. It tends to lead downhill in the long run. And I very strongly suggest you hold out for the real nourishment of fulfilling yourself, not anyone else. You can certainly find teachers, enlist in orders. Again, I've been in OTO for 33 years, don't have any immediate plans to quit. You can certainly bind yourself to a teacher, to a guru, to an instructor, to whatever you find fulfills your will that causes you to be more capable of expressing your nature. But if it fails that test, it is your duty to yourself, to use Crowley's term, to try another channel, try a different way. Now, this isn't to say that you should abandon a system the first time things start to seem sour. 
everybody goes through that. It's, it's the, you know, the dark night of the soul is the big version of it. But if years have gone by and your world is just getting smaller and sadder and less successful and you're miserable and there just doesn't seem to be an uphill patch to be found, perhaps you took a wrong turn. Perhaps you should retrace your steps and try a different path. Nobody gets points for sticking to a bad route. There's, there's no award for endurance in the face of signs saying turn back. So learn how to measure your success, which is just another way of saying, learn how to determine whether you're doing your will and then embrace systems that further that and discard systems that hinder that. That's your homework assignment. I'll look forward to seeing how it goes. Finally, if you find a system that works for you, then by all means, share it. That's what I've been doing this evening. I've been giving you a few examples of the kinds of things that Phyllis taught me that have served me. Applying these lessons of hers has, over the years, I believe, made me a better, more self-actualized, more fulfilled, happier person who, to whatever approximate degree, is able to express my will in my life. So I tell people about it on the theory that if it worked for me, and it seems to work for a few other people I know, it might work for you too but I am by no means setting myself up as an authority and I am offering you no guarantees. It is up to you to decide whether what I'm telling you tonight sounds like it will be useful to you. And then if you try applying any or all of it, it is up to you to decide whether it was in fact useful. I take no responsibility. I'm happy to provide advice. I'm happy to, as fellow explorers of, of the dark jungle, Stopping and trading maps now and then can be extraordinarily useful, which is why fraternal organizations of magicians exist. Our attainment is individual, but we can help each other. We, we each of us see from different angles. It's the blind man and the elephant. It may be that your fellow magician can see something about your work that you missed, as Phyllis did for me when she taught me how to break symmetries, how to embrace the deeper layers of connection between things that I resisted, but thank God I listened to her. But I also tested it, and fuck it, she was right, measurably right. Suddenly whole new universes opened up to me when I did that. I didn't take it as dogma. I didn't believe it because Phyllis said it. I believed it because it worked. And I am daring each of you to embrace that metric to measure the value of any aspect of your life. Is it helping or hindering your work. This is another painting by Phyllis, the angel. I absolutely love that one. Just think about the expression on her face that just, wow. So in conclusion, Phyllis was a living, breathing person. She made good choices, she made some very bad ones. She had transcendent insights and she made silly mistakes like the 419 debacle. She was utterly dedicated to her work. And part of that work was to help others discover and do their own work. Every one of us could benefit from being a little more like Phyllis. Love is the law, love under will. That was wonderful, Kathy, uh, thank you. And um, now um, we can open this up for some questions here. So we've been doing a bunch of astrology classes in various traditions lately and Phyllis was very much a fan of astrology. Do we have her accurate uh, natal data for those who are like, I want to dig into that. I believe it's it exists. I don't have it easily to hand. Um, Marlene, are you on here? And if so, do you know? So the we know Edmonton okay, for yeah. the birthplace. Do we know her birth time accurately? 
Yes, we do have that. Um, let me find out where I might have that handy, but I wasn't prepared to have it at the moment. Yeah, she has an entire chapter on uh, even analyzing her chart. So mm -hmm. hold on a second. Yeah, that was another exercise she had us do. Back back in the day, this, this was in ye olden times before computers were ubiquitous. And if you wanted an astrological chart, you needed to learn how to make one by hand with an ephemeris and you know, a table of time zones and all the, the old school way. I learned to do that. Um, and so you'd, you'd, you know, laboriously over the course of a couple of hours, figure out your birth chart and then write up an analysis for her. That was, that was another of her exercises. So while, Mar while Marlene is digging, are there any other questions, comments, accusations of heresy or other I matters of interest? I was acquainted with Grady in my teens and early 20s, and he makes so much more sense with Phyllis's story connected in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now she, she was, there, there were of course major influences on one another, but she was a, a wonderful stabilizing influence on him. Anybody else? You know, just a comment, and one of the um, aspects of the presentation that I find inspiring is that it becomes easy now that the, I think the OTO is, you know, a bit larger than it was during Phyllis's time to think that, oh, all this could just run without me. And I think, I think Phyllis is just a great example of how that work can continue within the individual, that that, that spark is really what moves things forward and, and, and brings life to, to, you know, the communities that we're a part of. And, and to each of us individually. One of, one of the things, again, anybody who's heard me talk has probably heard me bang this drum before, is that attainment is individual. That we don't do this in, in groups because we're going to attain as a group or because someone else is going to attain for us and that attainment doesn't have a brand name. There, there are plenty of people who's, who've achieved transcendent states of self-actualization or you know, oneness with God, or again, whatever, brand, whatever label you care to put on it, using a huge, huge number of different sacred systems and esoteric systems and, and just devotion to an art or to a science or to, you know, there's, there, are, there are so many different paths. There's, there's literally a path for each of us if you subdivide it down far enough. And so it's easy to get caught up in the idea that the, you know, the, it's, that it's surprising that she was able to carry on on her own when actually it's most mystics throughout history have done most of it on their own. And having a community that's supportive of it is wonderful and helpful, but auxiliary to the fact that the work happens in you. What a community does is what I was describing, what Phyllis did for me. She got me past some conceptual roadblocks, you know, by not, not by ordering me to do anything, not by telling me what to believe, but by making me ask the right questions. You know, she was very Socratic. That's, that's another thing I've learned from her is the best way to teach is to, to, to get someone to ask the right questions of themselves. And then the answers tend to happen and, and the person owns them. And that's, that is the benefit in the fact that we have these communities, that we have, you know, teachings and systems and the like, is it gives people a framework. There's, there's sort of a scaffolding around the building that keeps chunks of it from falling off while you're trying to build it. But when the building's done, the scaffolding is taken down. And I think there's a very strong metaphor there for, uh, you know, the great work or whatever you care to call it. Thank you.